It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. I hope that everybody just enjoyed their Easter Sunday because my Sunday for Easter was just so absolutely boring. I just was just bored out my mind during the Easter Sunday. And so hopefully you guys had a good time at your house, at your church, or whatever. Now, contrary to belief, although I criticize Christianity a lot, I am not necessarily, you can say, anti-Jesus per se. Because one thing to actually appreciate the person behind a religion, and another thing to actually criticize the religion as an institution for their actions. And so I'm not necessarily, you can say, anti-Jesus. I seem to be more anti-church. Now, the main topic for this video is, of course, the debate about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, as an atheist, I don't necessarily believe in the miracles that are attributed to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And here are my personal reasons on why I think that miracles tend to be very unlikely for the case of Jesus Christ. According to David Hume, he once famously said, that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be such of a kind that a falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. When it comes down to the sayings or the tribulations of Jesus Christ, the main gospels are the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the earliest book happens to be the book of Mark. The Gospel of Mark probably dates back from 66 to 70 AD, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke around 85 to 90 AD, and finally the Book of John dates back to 90 to 110 AD. Because the Book of Mark is the earliest book of the bunch, we know that most of the book is actually unique to Mark. But when it comes down to Luke and Matthew, they're not necessarily independent sources, because 41% of Luke and about 46% of Matthew comes directly from the book of Mark. Similarly, when it comes down to the books that are exclusive to both books, we know that 35% is actually unique to Luke, and about 20% is actually unique to Matthew. And when it comes down to double tradition, about 23% actually shares double tradition from Luke to Matthew. Also, it's worth pointing out that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John never once claimed to be eyewitnesses in the books. And we know this largely because if there actually are eyewitnesses, they would probably write down, I saw this or that, but they don't actually say that within the text. And we also know that the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were actually added out of church tradition the actual manuscripts themselves don't say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we literally have just no idea who actually wrote these books down to begin with. Now the earliest account comes directly from Mark 16 and it says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on the way to the tomb, and they asked each other who rolled the stone away from the entrance of the tomb. And when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was really large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Do not be alarmed, he said. We were looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where you laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. Now what is so strange is that the rest of the passages from verses 9 to 20 are actually considered to be forgeries according to the translation notes. As I stated before, the books of Matthew and Luke borrowed heavily from the book of Mark, and if the book of Mark have accounts based upon a forgery, 
Would that also mean that the other books that came after it are based upon the exact same forgery? Not to mention, it does not mention that the Twelve Disciples actually were there during the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, prior to the Gospels, there has been a series of letters that actually was done by Paul. Now, Paul himself did not claim to also be an eyewitness against a whole entire case of the resurrection either. And what's so strange is that many of the books or letters that are attributed to Paul are actually considered to be forgeries too. Now, some of the forgeries that has been identified by Bart Ehrman for the case of Paul include the first and second epistles to Timothy and so on. Now, according to Paul, he stated that he saw Jesus through a hallucination and that Jesus Christ also appeared to more than 500 people at the same time. Now, if it's really true that there was actually an event that evokes over 500 different people seeing a person at the same time, you would think that there's actually historical records of those 500 different people having that same type of vision that, of course, they had at that same day. But there's no such letters outside the Bible that actually confirm those 500 people. Because the book of Mark is the earliest book, it's much more grounded in reality in comparison to the later books. Because in the later books, there are various type of claims like Jesus can walk on water, that Jesus can actually heal the blind, that Jesus can actually, of course, turn water into wine, or that he can cast out demons and perform exorcisms. The claims become more and more exaggerated by every other book. I recommend a book that's by Dennis McDonald that's called The Gospels and Homer, which goes into great details of how many of the miracles for Jesus Christ come directly from Homer's Odyssey and the Iliad. In the book, the author makes the argumentation that many of the gospel writers were highly educated, sophisticated people that read many types of works and different stories and since people back then were actually young, they actually were encouraged to actually put their own personal spins on familiar stories, such as the Odyssey or the Iliad. And here are some examples that I will show you guys on which the ideas of the Odyssey or the Iliad comes directly for the miracles for Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 6, verse 48, it states that Jesus had the ability to walk on water. But what exactly does the Iliad have to say about this whole entire matter? Zeus and Hermes were on Mount Ida. They did not escape the notice of found sounding Zeus, those two men who appear on the plain. When he saw the old man, he took pity on him. Zeus then ordered Hermes to assist him. Hermes tried. Under his feet, his sandals, beautiful, immortal, golden, that carried him over the waters and over the boundless sea switch as the blast of the wind. According to Matthew chapter 27, verse 64 to 66 and so on, it tells us a story about the two guards that were trying to guard Jesus' body, and surprise, surprise, they were really surprised that Jesus was actually there. So what exactly does the Iliad actually have to say about this whole entire matter about the rising body and the two guards. Achilles kept Hector's body, which was protected by guards and bolted gates and doors. The god considered ordering Hermes to steal the body. Hermes of Zeus descended from Mount Ida to help recover Hector's corpse. When Hermes arrived at the camp, the god put the guards to sleep and opened the bolted gates and doors. According to Mark chapter 6, verse 41 to 44, Jesus Christ managed to feed like a lot of people with bread and fish, about over 5,000 people according to the story. In the Odyssey, Pisces served wine and said to Astina, O oh stranger, now pray to Lord Poseidon, Astina, and Telemachus offer prayers when they roast the outer meat and draw it off. They divided the portions and distributed the glorious fest. But when they had to put from the desire for food and drink, 
the 4,500 consists exclusively of men. Let's say for the sake of argumentation that the accounts about the resurrection are in fact done by eyewitnesses. What is the most nationalistic explanation to explain why someone could see somebody in an empty tomb? Now we know that there is something in the medical field that is known as folia do, and basically a folia do is a work condition involving two or more people that share a delusion or a false belief. So let's take these resurrection accounts at face value. Now imagine yourself being Mary Magdalene or Mary for example and you saw that your loved one got beaten, got bruised, got spit upon and he actually died on a cross. That right there is pretty much a very traumatic experience and of course, the fact that your son or your loved one actually died will send you in a state of depression. And of course, you're trying to cope over that. And so naturally, you just to see, like, of course, your son anywhere at once. And once you tell that person you see your son, that person will probably repeat it again and again and again. And therefore, the story continues to spread. That is one theory that I have that what happened in the best. My final argument comes directly from a theological ground and not a naturalistic explanation like the other examples that I have. But there is no such thing as the Trinity within the Bible itself. Not only does the word Trinity does not appear within the Bible itself, but on many different occasions, Jesus Christ called himself the Son of Man. The phrase Son of Man was used 32 times in Matthew, 14 times in Mark, 26 times in Luke, and about 10 times in John. He continued to say in John chapter 14 that the Father is actually greater than he is. When Jesus was dying on the cross, what was actually his final words? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? seems to suggest that again, he's actually calling out for his father for some help, which would mean that the father himself is higher than Jesus on the cross. Even the Old Testament goes in complete conflict with the New Testament on the idea of the Trinity. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, it says that children are not to be put to death for their parents. It's the same thing for Psalms chapter 49 verse 7. The final example is Isaiah chapter 40, where again, God is supposed to be everlasting. He cannot necessarily die. Now before someone points to me to Genesis chapter 1 verse 25, I did a whole entire video talking about the history of that particular verse right there. But to keep a long story short, the ideas about whether or not Jesus was divine or not came directly from the Council of Nicaea, the same sort of council that were also debating about Easter. And of course, Constantine used various types of theologians to actually put them together to actually argue about this whole entire process. The book of Genesis was written down roughly around 1200 BCE, and the Council of Nicaea took place around 325 AD. So you're mean to tell me that a book that actually, of course, took place in a time period that was way different than Greek society somehow has a reference to a trinity, even though such ideas were not as common back then when the population was much more polytheistic in nature. There are two main ways someone can actually read a text like the Bible. There's exegesis and entegesis. Now, exegesis is actually allowing you to actually interpret the text exactly what it says. And entegesis is actually when you put your own personal ideas into the text. And I think because many Christians are raised with the idea of a trinity, they put their own personal, you can say, ideas into the text and not necessarily not use the text for what it actually says. So these are my arguments against the idea of a resurrection. 
What do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section down below, and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.